Good morning. It is good to see you in God's house today. We welcome you to our service of worship as we gather on this ninth day of May. We also want to welcome all of those who will be watching us online at a later point. So whether you're in person or whether you're watching us online, we are so grateful that you have chosen to spend some of your time worshiping God with us today. And we hope and pray it will be beneficial to you. Of course, today is Mother's Day, so we do want to say a special um, a special blessing for our moms and for all those women who have helped us along the way. So um, we are so grateful for you and all that you have done for us. And I hope that if you have the opportunity that you'll be sure to call your mom and spend some time with her and tell her how much you love her and appreciate her. And so ladies, we want you to know that um, we appreciate all that you do to keep us, <laughs> keep us in line. And so thank you so much for all of those things. I do want to remind you of some of the things that are going on in the life of our church. We have several meetings this week. The Ad Council will meet tomorrow at 530. I know one of the things on our agenda will be next steps as far as with the um, pandemic and virus and mask and all those kinds of things. So we have several things on our agenda tomorrow. And then Tuesday, we will have a staff meeting and a church transformation meeting in the evening. So it'll be a busy day on Tuesday. And I want you to mark on your calendar May 20th, which is a Thursday night. The Learning Tree will be doing a open house. I believe it's at 5 o'clock p.m. Check your newsletter to be sure with some of the things that they're doing over there. And one of our goals with Learning Tree is to, to have an opportunity to invite those children and their families to worship. And we want to build some of those relationships. So we invite you to put that on your calendar and make that a priority to attend um, that over there at Learning Tree and see what they're doing as well as to meet some of those parents and students uh, that are working over there. So please mark that on your calendar. So that's some of the things that are coming up in the life of our church. Are there others that we need to mention this morning? All right. I'd like to invite you then to Take your bulletin and turn with me to our call to worship. I'll read the light print and invite you to respond with the bowl. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Amen. Would you join with me in our opening prayer? In you, O God, every family on earth receives its name. Illumine the homes of this earth with the light of your love, granting courage to those who are hurt or lonely, endurance to those who care for sick family members and wisdom to those in fearful times of change we thank you for the gifts we have received from mother father spouse child or friends as we have been loved by you and by others so may we love grant us your peace through jesus the christ amen our opening hymn is number 374, Standing on the Promises. Of course, you can't sing this hymn sitting down, so we invite you to please stand as we sing number 374. We'll sing the first and the last verses. Number 374. <laughs> Thank you. 
you. As we come to a time of prayer in our service, I would remind you of the names that are listed on the back of your bulletin. There are a couple of folks that I want to update you on. Uh, Fran Walton's procedure is scheduled for tomorrow, so please uh, pray for her. Also, I'm told that Tammy Hyde is back in the hospital, so we want to um, ask your prayers for her. And uh, also, even though Mother's Day is a good day for many, we know that it's a difficult day for some, so we also want to remember those who's, um, who cannot call their mom today. Maybe they have passed and are spending uh, Mother's Day with Jesus, or maybe miles in between, or broken relationships, or for whatever reason. And so we also want to remember all those for whom Mother's Day is, is a difficult day. Um, we, I did um, talk with Katie this week, and we certainly want to pray for her as she uh, prepares to, to move and transition. And um, so we have about six more weeks with you. And uh, so we, we want to pray for, for all those as the t clock is ticking and it just seems like it's around the corner. But um, we, we want to continue to pray for God to make the way for, for those who are moving. So um, those are some of the ones that are before you. Are there others that you would like to mention this morning that are in need of our prayers? Randy Possa is in the hospital. Yeah. And Pat needs your prayers too. Okay. He is still in the hospital. I wasn't sure if he was still in or not. Okay. For Randy Possa. Carl's mother, Brenda Bryant, is having a procedure tomorrow. Okay. For Brenda Bryant. Paul Bush. Tell me again. Paul Bush of the U-S-H-A. Okay, Paul Bush. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to pray for uh, Norman Barton. Okay. He's in the hospital, and he's Hector Durena. Okay, for Norman Barton. Okay. For Tracy Williams. For Tracy Williams. For Steve Adams, yes. All right, also um, pray for our annual conference, which will be um, in a little less than two weeks. One of the things that we'll be voting on at annual conference is a redistricting plan that would move Winfield into the Alexandria district with um, Carly Pigeon as your superintendent. So that's one of the things that's on the agenda for us to, to vote on and to talk about at annual conference in, on May the 22nd. So that's just a couple weeks away. Okay, others this morning. What about Dick Watts and Jim Wiley? How are they doing? Um, I talked to Dick Watts this week and he is still waiting for um, a doctor's appointment and uh, still kind of on hold, so. Um, and I don't, I haven't heard anything about him. I'll have an update on them. He, he's, he's got confirmed uh, lung cancer. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Others this morning. All right. So let us join together in prayer. Oh Lord, we are grateful for the day that you have given us, for the opportunity that we have to come into your house, for the privilege that we have to worship you freely in this country, for so many that protect those freedoms, Lord, we are so grateful. And Lord, especially on this Mother's Day, we are so grateful for all of the women who have touched our lives, those that have given birth to us and those who have helped us along the way, be they Sunday school teachers or teachers at school or friends and family, aunts and grandparents, all those who have been a mother to us. And Lord, we, we give you thanks for those who have helped us in our path. Lord, we also remember so many for which this day is a difficult day. Maybe their mother has passed from this life to the next, or relationships are broken or miles or keep us separate from one another. Lord, we, we also remember so many for whom this day is a day that is a difficult one, and we pray that you would be present and with them. Lord, as we think about Paul's writing to the book of Philippi, we realize that Paul had every reason to boast of his own accomplishments and, and his, own, his own history and heritage. But Lord, we know that his, his main goal was to see Jesus glorified, 
And so, Lord, we pray that that would also be our goal, that it would be among the things that are most important to us, the things that matter most. And so, Lord, as we hear your word from the book of Philippians today, and as we think about Paul's writing to them, Lord, we pray it would be your word to us, that your Holy Spirit would come and gather in this place and would lead us and guide us to draw us closer to you and to one another. Lord, as we gather, we are also mindful of the needs that are all around us. We do continue to pray for our country and our leaders and our state, national and local level and our own community. Lord, we pray that uh, as we think about what you're calling us to do, that you would help us to be willing to reach out to our community and to encourage them to, to come and to worship you in this place. And Lord, to, to, to simply take a step of faith, knowing that you're with us. Lord, we also are mindful of so many that are ill. We have mentioned several this morning that are in need of your healing touch, and we, we do pray for them. We, we pray for those that are recovering from surgery, awaiting surgery, maybe just under the weather, that your healing touch would be with them. Lord, we also remember so many that have lost a loved one to death, that your comfort and peace would be with them. Lord, we do continue to pray for our young people, for our confirmands that um, took, made a profession of faith for themselves last week and took their own vows. We give you thanks for our graduating seniors who, will, who we will recognize next week. We give you thanks for them and we pray that your blessing would be on them on these last days of school. Lord, we also remember all those things that are on our hearts and minds that maybe we didn't mention this morning. Maybe it does have to do with school or work or friends or family. But Lord, whatever it is, we are so grateful that you love us, that you care for us, and you hear us when we pray. And it is all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, over the last several weeks, we have been working our way through the book of Philippians. We have also invited you to follow along with the Seedbed Daily Text by J.B. Walt, and I'll be quoting J.B. several times in my message. Today is also our featuring our memory verse for the series, which there are a few laminated cards left on the table as you leave if you'd like to pick one up, and we're inviting you to take one of those and to put it in a prominent place at your home and to help us and to memorize the... Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, and so that you can carry it with you wherever you go, even if you don't have your Bible handy, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that verse today. So today, as we continue in our, our study of Philippians, next week will be, we will finish it, and today I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. And so I invite you to hear the word of the Lord today from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature of be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When Alexander the Great's army conquered the great Persian Empire after a long siege, Alexander's soldiers overran the city and they went straight to the palace of Darius, the Persian king. They were looking for food and drink after the siege. And while they were looking, one soldier came upon a beautiful leather bag that contained the crown jewels of Persia. Today, these stones and jewels would have been worth, been worth millions. But the soldier was starving. So he simply dumped them on the ground, saving only the leather bag and filling it with all the food and drink that he could carry. You see, the soldier knew what was most important. He knew that despite their worth, one could not eat or drink jewels. He knew the things that mattered the most. Paul also knew what mattered the most. And so in this reading from the book of Philippians, he reminded the church at Philippi about his own credentials as a Jew and how impeccable that they were. But something had happened to Paul, that he had met the living Christ and it changed him. So what did Paul find? in his new faith in Jesus that mattered so much to him. A few ideas for you this morning. I believe the first thing that Paul found was freedom. Paul found freedom. You see, Paul had spent much of his life trying to save himself through strict adherence to the law. In fact, in verse four, this is what he writes. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Paul says that if anybody could point to who they were and what they had done in order to make them right with God, surely he would be at the very top of the list. He begins by saying, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Paul was a full blooded Jew born to Jewish parents. The fact that he was circumcised on the eighth day was accordance with the Jewish law, which dates all the way back to Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Furthermore, for, furthermore, Paul states that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, you might remember that there were 12 tribes of Israel. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. But the tribe of Benjamin was the tribe of nobility. The first king of Israel, Saul, which Paul might have been named after, came from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was considered one of the leading tribes. In fact, when the Israelites went out to fight a battle and a war, it was the Benjamites who led the way. What Paul is saying is that I am a royal blue blood, Jewish through and through. So we know that Paul was from a great family, religiously speaking. He had a great religious heritage, but Paul learned what we all need to learn, 
that being born into a certain religion or being born into a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian any more than being born in an oven makes you a biscuit. It wouldn't matter if Billy Graham were your father and Mother Teresa were your mother and your grandfather was the Pope, you would still need Jesus. This is how J.D. Walt describes it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is simultaneously the most exclusive and the most inclusive offer in the universe. Total exclusivity. There is only one way by which human beings can be saved. By grace through faith in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. Nothing but the blood of Jesus as the old standard sings. Total inclusivity. Anyone can be saved. All who repent of their sin and place their trust in Jesus Christ. No one is unqualified or disqualified. In fact, because of the prevenient grace of God, everyone is pre-qualified. The free grace of God has, in essence, freed the will of the human race to make a decision to trust Christ. But everyone must decide. Paul goes on to say, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. If Paul was a Roman Catholic, we would say that Paul is more Catholic than the Pope. He was more Jewish than the high priest. He was a purebred. He goes on to say that furthermore, concerning the law of Pharisee, a member of the religious aristocracy, to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. You had to meticulously keep hundreds and hundreds of laws to keep all of the commandments. He was literally the cream of the crop. You would have never questioned his integrity or his goodness. He wouldn't lie, cheat, or steal. You could trust him with your life or with your wife. Nobody's trophy case was larger. Paul would have been the man of the year, the man of the decade, the man of the century, because he had such an outstanding resume. But Paul says all of this is loss compared to knowing Jesus Christ. J.D. Walt says... What happened? Paul met Jesus and he never got over it. He met the one for whom he had longed. Once we see the treasure of Jesus, our trophies so pale in comparison, we regard them as trash. Oh, that we would meet Jesus and never get over it. Oh, that we would meet Jesus and continue to grow in our faith and knowledge of him. In fact, Paul says that everything else, all of the good that I've done, all of that history and all of that heritage is rubbish compared to Jesus. Now, rubbish is actually a pretty kind translation. This is the word you would use for garbage, for something being thrown out because it's useless. And Paul says that's how that is. All of that other stuff is useless compared to knowing Jesus. Paul learned that we could never be good enough or righteous enough or do those things that are necessary to earn God's love. It is simply something that comes to us. Robert Ingersoll was a famous agnostic, and he enjoyed arguing particularly with Christian clergymen. And one day Ingersoll was conversing with Charles Horace Talmadge, one of the great preachers of the day about Connecticut's blue laws, which dates this story quite a bit in history. And of course, if you remember blue laws, that they are laws that forbid certain activities on Sunday. And so Ingersoll asked, would you like to live in a community, Mr. Talmadge, where not one cigar could be smoked? and not one drop of liquor could be drunk. Certainly, Talmadge replied, that would be almost heaven. And would you like to live, continued Ingersoll, where no one could play on the Sabbath day and where everyone had to go to church? Oh yes, Talmadge declared, that would suit me. It would be paradise to live in a community where everyone was compelled to go to church on Sunday where no one could drink a drop and where the law would make every man good. 
And you think such a man would be a Christian, asked Ingersoll, a better man than I. Of course, Talmadge replied. Then Ingersoll said, I advise you to go down to the Sing Sing prison, where there is a community of 1,500 men and women governed in precisely that manner. They are all good because they are forced to be. Talmadge says, I learned a lesson that day that being good simply because it is required has no saving power. St. Paul also discovered the same thing, that keeping the law by itself, religion by the rules, would never fill his deepest need. Even today, there are those that think that religion is about following the rules. I don't think it's that way. I think it's more about a relationship with Jesus Christ, but there are people that think that religion is about following the rules. But what if, what if our religion became more about Jesus than about following the rules? And I wondered, well, what stands in our way of making the same decision that Paul made, that all the things that we've done maybe as a mother or as a parent or as a, a professional, as a person, what are those things that we so often put on our shelf and we say, look at these, look at what I have accomplished. And maybe they keep us from following Jesus as we should. Maybe we become so concerned about our own pride and our own accomplishment that we forget that all of these things are gifts from God. Maybe it's our social status, or maybe it's our material possessions. Maybe it's our desire for approval or our need for control, our needs and wants. Maybe it's our fear or our guilt and shame. What is it that stands between us and a wholehearted commitment like Paul made to following Jesus to say, all that other stuff, it can go in the garbage. I'm committed to following Jesus. For Paul, he had the law of Moses to overcome, his family lineage, his own self-righteousness, his social standing. But Paul says, what's most important to me is Jesus. He gained freedom in Christ. Secondly, Paul found unconditional love. Paul found unconditional love. You see, rigid obedience to the law makes God's love appear to be conditional. The message of such faith is I love you only when you are obedient, only when you are sinless, only when you do what you are supposed to do, only when you measure up to my standards. But Paul knew better, that Paul had learned that the grace of God is more important than following the letter of the law. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it reads this way. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, that proves Christ died for us. That's a special kind of love that God didn't wait for us to get our lives together. God didn't wait for us to turn to him. God didn't wait for us to do what we were supposed to before he sent Jesus. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's unconditional love life-changing power that can make a difference in the lives of so many people. Representative Maxine Waters was a congressman from Los Angeles, and she said that one of the first people to make a difference in her life was a fifth grade math teacher named Louise Carter. She says beyond her skill at teaching math, Miss Carter was a very loving woman. She recalls one Saturday morning in particular where Miss Carter had planned a class picnic. However, Waters' mother had not been able to get her ready in time to go to the picnic because of her 12 brothers and sisters. Her mother was so busy trying to get everything done, but she just had not got to Maxine yet. And so Waters thought that she was going to miss the picnic and was heartbroken. But the Congresswoman said, then Miss Carter came. She would not leave without me. She took me to her own home and washed and braided my hair and got my clothes together so that I could go on the picnic. 
and it stayed with me forever that she would do that. If you think that a teacher really cares about you, Waters said, then you try to live up to their expectations. Miss Carter had high expectations for me, and especially after that picnic, I tried my best to live up to them. So is the picture of God. That's what God does for us. That God loves us even while we are unkempt and ugly, even when we are sinners, God picks us up, takes us home, washes us and cleanses us. And because we are loved, then we try to live up to God's expectations. We live a worthy life, not to earn God's love, but because we are recipients of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Paul says, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul says that Jesus is the greatest possession. Remember that Paul is writing from prison. He has lost every other thing, intangible and tangible things that was dear to him. But in their place, he has found the, the possession, the one greater possession that is greater than anything else, Jesus Christ. When Paul met Jesus, his entire life was turned upside down and turned around, and he finally realized that he had enough righteousness to take him to church, but he did not have enough redemption to take him to heaven. J.D. Walt says it this way, Paul wanted us to know who Jesus was for him and what Jesus had done for him and how Jesus lived in him. He wanted to show us Jesus's merit badge, the cross. He wanted Jesus to be admired and appreciated and affirmed. What if we lived our lives that way? What if we lived our lives in such a way that, that people would look at us and say, I bet that person knows Jesus. Rather than saying, I think that's a great person, or I think you're a great person, maybe we could say, it's all because of what Jesus has done in my heart and in my life. That's what Paul did. He found an unconditional love that changed his life. And so he pointed to Jesus. The last thing I want you to see is that Paul found something worth living for. Paul found something worth living for. He says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. J.D. Walt says, Paul does not begin with I should or I ought to or I need or I wish or I think. It says I want, which lands us in the realm of longing and desire and deep will. Note also that the scripture does not say, I want to know about Christ. This is not mere knowing for knowledge sake. This is the knowing of a deep personal relationship, the knowing of deep calling to deep. Now what's astonishing about this verse to me is that when Paul is writing it, we think he has known Jesus for over 30 years. So what did Paul say? What did Paul mean when he said, I want to know him. What he means is he wants to know him better. This word know does not mean just intellectual knowledge, but this is deep, practical, personal, experiential knowledge. It means to know something by real experience. I want to know the person of Jesus is what Paul says. I want to know the power of Jesus. I want to know the passion of Jesus. I want to know something to live for. In Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman, Willie Loman's wife cannot understand why Willie would commit suicide, particularly at this time in his life. For the first time in 35 years, he was about to be free and clear. Willie only needed a little salary and he would even be paid off at the dentist. But a friend sums up Willie's situation like this. 
No man only needs a little salary. When a person's dreams and goals and purposes in life are destroyed, that person is destroyed. We not only need something to live on, we need something to live for. You see, after he met Christ, and once he continued to get to know Jesus, Paul says, now I have something to live for. In fact, Paul says that I forget what lies behind, and I'm straining to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It was no longer about religious rule keeping for Paul. It was about winning the race and claiming the prize. You see, Paul discovered that there is no ceiling on discipleship, that we can be better followers of Jesus at 70 than we were at 40. We can be better followers of Jesus as we grow from being a man to a youth, to being an adult, and then finally graduate from this life to the next. If your dream is to be like Christ, you will never reach the point where you say, I have got there. This is as far as I can go. Paul found something worth living for, the prize of the upward calling of God. I heard about a minister in the Midwest who performed the marriage ceremony for a lovely young woman and a fine young man whose dreams of continuing the family farm ran high. But shortly after their third child was born, the wife developed an incurable disease. Everything the young farmer owned slipped away from him in the long months that his wife spent in the hospital and the many medical bills that came due. Well, on their 10th anniversary, the preacher was invited to their home to share in a very simple meal. There was no pie, no cake, no homemade rolls, but the minister remembers we had cold buttermilk that was chilled in a jug in the cold waters of a spring. But it was a feast because of the love that had set the table. The minister went on to say, I could not help but weep as I saw that young man moving around the table, waiting on his sick wife and their three children. The tenderness of the young farmer and his sick wife caught my heart. Well, they sat around the table and they talked for a while and then the pastor got up to go. The young man said, just a minute, preacher. Before you go, I want you to see her anniversary present. So he went to the dresser and he pulled out a bottom drawer and produced a thin, flat package, which was a set of pearls. The preacher assumed that they must be an imitation. How could a poor farm boy afford the real thing under such circumstances? Shut your eyes, the young farmer said as he reached around the, wife, the neck of his wife to fasten the pearls, and she reached up and held them in her fingers and said, they're real. They can't be mine. Are they mine? And then the young husband told an unbelievable story. You know, before we were married, you said you thought pearls were the prettiest jewelry in the world. A long time before we got married, I asked the Lord to help me put this string of pearls around your neck. You never knew about this box. I started dropping money in it, nickel by nickel and dime by dime. I was fond of tobacco. I gave up tobacco and put the money in the box. I was fond of cold Cokes, but for 13 years, the 10 years we've been married and the three years before, I haven't spent a nickel on those. It's all gone into the box. And now the pearls are yours and they are paid for. She said, what made you do it? What made you do it? And the farm boy fell on his knees and put his face in her lap and cried like a baby. And as the minister snuck out the door, he heard the husband say, I did it because I love you. The preacher said, I have often wondered how long that big man stayed on his knees weeping in the lap of that little woman who had less than a year to live. You see, that fella knew what mattered most 
that Cokes and tobacco and those things, they were only temporary. Paul said the same thing, that Paul found in Jesus some things that really mattered. He discovered freedom. He discovered unconditional love. And he found something worth living for. And so I hope and pray that you will think about those things that matter most to you. On Mother's Day, maybe it is a parent. Maybe it is faith in Jesus. All of those things add up for us. But what if, what if we spent our lives pursuing the things that mattered most and left some of the other things behind in the rubbish heap? Let us pray. Oh Lord, we are challenged by the words of Paul. Lord, forgive us when we have placed value on the things that don't really truly matter all that much. Instead, Lord, we pray that you would help us to search our hearts and lives and to focus our beings on those things that matter most to us. We give you thanks for, for Jesus and his unconditional love that he came to us even while we were still sinners, that he didn't wait for us to be good, but instead you sent Jesus anyway, and we are so grateful. Lord, we are so grateful for the freedom that we enjoy, the freedom to follow Jesus, the freedom to be who you've called us to be, the freedom not to be simply shackled by religion, but to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for the freedom that he offers to us. Lord, we are so grateful that we have something to live for, in following Jesus, we pray that our faith would grow each and every day, that we would be more like Jesus tomorrow than we are today. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to consider and to find the things that matter most in our lives and in the life that is yet to come. And it is all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our closing hymn this morning is found on page 399 in your hymnal. Take my life and let it be. We'll sing the first and the last this morning, number 399. Would you stand as we sing together the first and the last verse? including bringing us to church and teaching us to follow Jesus throughout our lives. I know that's one of the things that I've learned from my mom, and I'm so grateful for that. So as we depart, I invite you to depart with this closing prayer and also want to remind you of the, the many things that are going on in the life of the church this week. And so let us pray together. 
Oh Lord, we are so grateful for your many blessings. We are so grateful that you have given us something to live for, that there are things in life that matter, and we are so grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for the moms and the women and the ladies along the way who have touched our lives and taught us about you and about life. We ask that you would bless them on this Mother's Day and that you would be with them. And so, Lord, as we depart from this place, we pray that you would help us to follow Jesus with our whole heart, that others would see him in us, and that the things we do and say would reflect upon Jesus in such a way that it would bring you glory and praise. And it is all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. You are dismissed. God bless you.